Never been discussed. Never, there has never been any further discussion on that potential plan. There is a garage on the lot. The parks department now mows the property, but otherwise there is no caretakers or effort, efforts made to produce a viable opportunity for this vacant lot. I want to address the school board and leadership to ask for reconsideration and selling me the property. After having been at home for over 25 years, I am very invested in my neighborhood and plan to continue to be for many years to come. I would like the opportunity to purchase the plot and assume all caregiving responsibilities. Best regards, Rhonda Pearl. Okay. Next, I have an email from Eduardo Lopez. I strongly encourage the board to vote for a mask mandate in schools. If no masks are mandated, it opens the possibility for so many students to be bullied because I will be sending my son to school with a mask. This is from Rebecca Peters. I am, e I am emailing to ask the district to keep the mask mandate for elementary school as COVID vaccines are unavailable for these kids and with COVID cases on the rise, these kids need that protection. I sent a message last week with a few examples as to why I believe kids should, be, should remain masked. One reason was last year during in-school learning, my daughter had a classmate who was sent to school while sent to school while their families were sick. Parents would pump their kids full of fever-reducing medication to mask temps so their child could pass the temp screen. screen. Multiple times, these parents would post on social media that they were all sick while sending their kids to school and giving tips to other parents on how to pass the COVID screening. My daughter, even in the same room as these kids, never got sick last year, and I fully believe it was because of the social distancing and the mask protocol. However, at this point, I do not believe that we can rely on the honor system to entrust the parents won't send their sick or exposed kids to school. My daughter should be able to go to school during the pandemic without fear of getting sick, especially now that we're back to fully in school with no e-learning options. So I am asking that masks stay at least for this school year. The next one is from Lexi Frazier. In regards to masks, making masks mandatory this school this year, I just don't see how there's any other option if safety is our number one concern. Besides our children who are not eligible for the vaccine yet, and the many families who won't get it by choice. I think there is more to be looked at when it comes to our middle and high schoolers who are eligible. We already have so many peer pressures that come with this age group. Why add more? They're going to feel like they need to take their mask off after being dropped off because it's not school, or they are going to go home sick or be afraid to go to school at all because they are being called names they hear their parents use about people who wear masks. These kids have dealt with enough emotionally this past year and don't need any more added weight on them to take their minds off of schoolwork and being sick. Schools should not only be safe, but they should feel safe, period. My family and I are vaccinated. And that's not the end of us doing our part. We continue to wear masks for those that choose not to and for those who cannot get the vaccine. Now I'm asking you to do your part and keep our students and teachers safe. <clears throat> Make face masks and or face shields part of the dress code for the 2021-2022 school year in Moline and Hill Valley. There is already enough division in the world. Ask yourself, do you want to be responsible for adding it to our school? Um, this one is from Kylie Lewis. <clears throat> Hello. I think it should not be mandatory for elementary students to wear masks at school. They do not have air conditioning. They will be going back full time. They shouldn't have to wear masks in that type of environment. Thanks. The next one is from Amber Bowers. Be the president, I'm sorry, we the parents. <laughs> of the Moline School District, ask the school board to promptly remove mandatory mask wearing for all children and staff at our school and make masks optional. A petition has been started and it currently has 486 signatures in support 
of making maps optional for the 2021-2022 school year. The mask mandate was lifted in the state of Illinois. It is unnecessary and not healthy to continue to require our children and school staff to wear masks at school or while participating in school activities. It is our duty as adults to not only protect the younger generation, but also do as much as possible to ensure they thrive. There is no statutory law that mandates masks. As a parent, we are seeing negative side effects of wearing masks, including headaches, breathing issues, anxiety, depression, skin infection, increased allergy symptoms, increased asthmatic symptoms, social problems, and psychological damage. We are taking a stand for the mental, physical, emotional, and social well-being of our children. We believe parents' families should be able to perform their own risk assessment, considering all physical, mental, emotional, and psychological risks and benefits of their own children when it comes to all medical visions, including masking. This has gone on long enough. Our children deserve better, and it is up to all of us to give them to give that vision to them. We applaud other Illinois schools for the mass optional plan and ask that only we'll join the school district. They are prioritizing our children's mental and physical and emotional health. Thank you, Amber Bowers. Okay. Then my last from reading out loud is um, from Amelia D. Um, I am a parent of three elementary students in Moline, Jane Adams. I understand that the issue of mask wearing for the fall semester will be discussed with tonight's meeting. I understand that CDC guidance has said that those who are fully vaccinated may go without masks, though that is now wavering as well. That being said, every single elementary student is, is unvaccinated as of yet. So how is that even a debate at the elementary level? I understand that at the high school, those students and staff are going to get the vaccine probably already back. And in the middle school, many of those students are old enough to receive the vaccine. <laughs> At this point, with elementary students being too young for a vaccine, masks are literally the only protection for them as the classes will once again fall rather than half the class. Please do not take away the mask requirement until every individual who wishes to protect themselves against COVID via the vaccine has the chance to do so. I feel if the mask requirement is taken away, then the full remote option needs to be reinstated regardless if anyone in the household is considered high risk or not. A month ago, the numbers for COVID looked really good. That has drastically changed, changed and will continue to rise. Once school resumes with our overcrowded classrooms, it will just be a matter of time before significant outbreaks occur. Please do not remove masks yet. I'm not saying you're right. Okay. I will call your name. You will come to the podium. I'll start my timer and I am going to apologize ahead of time if I mess your name up. Please forgive me. Can I please have Malia Grant or Grant? Grant. Malia. Malia Grant. Go okay. Yeah. Good evening, school board members. I'm Molly McGrath and I go to Wilson Middle School and we're in eighth grade. I'm going to talk, talk about why I'm against masks in school since we're going back into our regular schedule that will be eight hours of masks. And Jim doesn't help at all. Uh, you may think it's a good idea to wear them, but you're not the ones who are going to be working out for an hour and a half with other sweaty, other sweaty, hard breathing kids. We're changing in hot, steamy locker rooms. Another thing, we're both the kids with asthma. Asthma. Like I said before, I have a hard time breathing masks and I don't have asthma, but I have had to use my hand because of the masks. Um, so just imagine the kids out there puffing and wheezing, struggling to breathe. Masks are also a distraction. When I'm in class, I'm going to focus on the teacher and what I'm learning about. I have math falling down at every 10 seconds. I'll know for a fact that other kids struggle with the problems as well. You can constantly tell teachers to fold their masks when really their masks can be slipped down for a slight second. Honestly, this is annoying for both the student and the teacher. Therefore, I believe that students should not wear masks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, Judy Ramsey. Thank you, 
enough people online so if you could speak as loud as possible, that would be great. Is this a microphone? Yes. yes. Because we can't hear you back there. Um, so my name is Judy Ramsey. I'm a resident of Moline, and I find it interesting that the state of Illinois has gone so low as to make the school board part of the health department. I think it's ridiculous that um, they've pushed it back down to you to decide whether or not a child needs to wear a mask or not in school. Um, Frankly, masks do not work. If you will talk to any informed doctor, they will tell you that a mask does not work. It does not keep any germs or anything else from uh, entering into your child. They're going to be out playing and doing other things. And, you know, masks really at this point in the situation that we've been in are ridiculous. I didn't even wear a mask all year. Um, another thing that um, I wanted to bring up is the fact that, you know, down the line, they're gonna want you to, to teach critical race theory. Seriously, do you guys have children in school and do you want that brought up to your child that, they can't be proud of the color of their own skin. Do you not realize that whether you're black, brown, red, or, or white, that you all bleed red for a reason? Because we're all human beings and the color of our skin has nothing to do with uh, a critical race theory being taught in schools. It's ridiculous. And I also wanted to bring up the fact that, you know, it gets, it's getting younger and younger and younger that you want to teach sex education from kindergarten, first grade, second grade. You want to go to gender dysphoria, all this nonsense when you need to be teaching reading, writing, and arithmetic and nothing else. Everything else needs to be taught from the parental standpoint. And if they don't have parents at home, they can find somebody that can teach them that, but it doesn't belong in the schools. Thank you. Okay, um, Fred Ambridge. Hi, my name is Chris Etheridge. Um, Scobian here from Wolverine. I value the protection of the students and their well-being as a fundamental part of schooling. As a custodian, I take measures every day to keep students safe so that they can one day make good on the promise of their education, so that they can be healthy and capable, not just credentialed and graduated. Long COVID is increasingly a burden on young people with health impacts that may follow them the rest of their lives. It is unacceptable to me that we are here today to even have to discuss the most minimal steps to stop the spread of COVID among students, staff, and faculty. The assumed negatives that may result from wearing a mask are far outweighed by the benefits. Let me read that. The assumed negatives that may result from wearing a mask are far outweighed by the negatives, but with the benefits. And in the end, we should be doing everything that we can to help prepare students to live these in these rapidly changing times. And that includes the threat of pandemics, not just now, but in the future. How does sticking our head in the sand over masks teach these kids anything meaningful about what it takes to adapt and survive? We are all better than this. Thank you. Hello, my name is Destiny Maynard, and my daughter was a student last year at Moline High School. This was by far the worst year for not only just my child, but most students and staff. My daughter has always struggled with anxiety, and then piled COVID and masking on top of most of, of what most of you already know is her grief, and it's a disaster. Online school was just something that was not successful for us, and I dread homeschool, but I will if I have to. I understand the spotlight is on you right now to make the right decision for everyone involved. However, however, our governor left it up to the individual districts to make the right decision for their students and staff. Please, I ask you, leave this choice to the parents. 
We know what is best for our children. Masking simply is ineffective. And masking seven plus hours a day simply isn't safe. The people that wanted the vaccination got it. And based on that logic of how vaccines are supposed to work, they're protected. I mean, the survival rate of COVID is what, 98, 20%. What more are you looking for? Our children are playing sports maskless. They're having sleepovers with their friends maskless. Yes. They're shopping maskless. They're at times in this school maskless. So why make them mask in class or in a hallway, but not in the lunchroom? Doesn't make a lot of sense. If this was truly a pandemic, then we wouldn't even be coming back to school. Please think about what masking is doing to the students. The young minds that are already suffering with anxiety, PTSD, autism, and that's just to name a few. I'm standing up here fighting for our kids, but at the same time, I'm also thanking you guys for your dedication to our students. So thank you. Thank you. And Mark. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Ann Marks. I'm a grandma. I live outside Moline School, but I have children in the Moline School District. I'm very, they're very proud of being a Moline Maroon. We wear all the colors. We have cars that color. We, we really, you know, well, let's know that we have what we bought into the Moline School System. But what I was really upset about is the fact that we would think about masking children again after we just got through with that last year. We have gone through that. The vaccinations have been as successful, they say. And so I don't believe it's something, it's something that parents should be able to opt out of, not have to be mandated to mask. I also am, um, would like to say to the Board of Education that I wish you would consider opting out of the transgender uh, education and the critical race theory. Yes. That is something that can be opted out. And I think it's something that needs, the parents need to teach their children at home. The parents need to be responsible to their children in these areas. Please let the children learn in the school. The teachers have a lot on their plate. They do, they can't, but science, math, English, reading, all the different specialized classes in school, they have a lot to do. And to add this to them, it seems to me to be over the top and not really an education thing, it's something that education should be involved in, but something that parents should be involved in. Thank you so much. Forgive me if I mispronounce Bernal Eckhart. Yep. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks. You did it right. Oh, awesome. <laughs> That's rare. It's a hard name. Well, my nickname's Bernie. I'm a father of three, uh, four, six, and eight. They're all in the Moline School District. And I prepared this here. Um, children are the least vulnerable to COVID-19. There's no serious risk to them from the disease. And there's no serious risk of them spreading the disease to the adults. But children are vulnerable in general physically, emotionally, developmentally, and you are putting them at great risk of untold harms by muzzling them with these masks in schools for eight hours a day. You're teaching them to be deathly afraid of something they have no need to fear and to irrationally believe that a piece of cloth on their face makes them invincible or a hero. You're preventing them from seeing the faces and expressions of their teachers and their peers, taking away part of their identity and violating their personal liberty and autonomy. These masks make it more difficult for them to breathe, to speak, and to be heard clearly. They're, they're hot and uncomfortable. They become damp and full of bacteria, full of bacteria. I smelled my son's mask like one day after he came back from school, it was like the most vile thing I've ever heard. I had to wash it. He decided he must spit a lot, and he's four, so I mean, <laughs> but anyway, they're just, they're unnecessary. The children are not at risk. Um, you shouldn't be forcing masks on them 
like the ladies before me said, it should be up to the parents, I think. And it's up to you guys and gals. The burden of proof is on you to demonstrate that masking children is healthy, necessary, and effective. Yes. But you won't give any hard evidence of that because there is not any. The opposite is the truth, and we will all know it. Quit the charade and don't be a lemming. Use your common sense and stop muzzling our kids. And thank you for all you do. That's all. Thank you. Krista Newberry. Krista wanted to be heard tonight, but she asked if I would read her statement. Okay, thank you. On behalf of Moline seniors for the class of 2021, I think kids should have, I think kids should not have to wear masks. Many of the Moline schools are still not air conditioned. And it is really hard to breathe when the schools are so hot. I just graduated and I was fully online from October to, until the end. And let me tell you, my physical and mental health took a big spiral, down, spiral downward. There are many days where I didn't leave my house. Yes, it was my choice to do full online, but here are just a few examples of why. The high school teachers were super strict about the masks. One slit below your nose, and they were instantly saying, mask needs to be covering the mouth and nose. I tried to keep, I, I, I get trying to keep everyone safe, but us and our parents should have been the ones deciding if we were to wear a mask or not. Another thing is climbing three flights of stairs is already difficult enough for some people. Now add wearing a mask finding them. It sucks. Thank you. Thank you. Also, how is lunch going to be handled? 
Obviously, the kids will have to remove their masks to eat. It's not like COVID gets put on pause so they can eat. If they take them off for lunch, snack time, and water breaks, there is no reason they should wear them the rest of the day. My grade schoolers are going into first and second grade. They both wish not to wear masks. They both wear glasses, and the masks cause their glasses to fog up, so then they have a difficult time seeing. I sat down and talked to both of them and asked them why they didn't like wearing them, and they gave me a list. Each of them separately told me the exact same things. One, our glasses fog up. Two, the mask falls down when we talk. Three, masks are hot. Four, my mask makes it harder to breathe. Five, the mask hurts my ears. It rubs on them all the time. Six, we can't always understand what the teacher and other kids are saying. Seven, we take the mask down for a snack or when we have to take a drink, so why can't we just leave them off? The kids need to be able to see their teacher's face and lips when they are talking so that they can understand them and learn how to move their mouths to say certain words. Think about this. Us as adults sometimes rely on watching a person's mouth to be able to understand what they are saying. So kids that are just learning a bigger vocabulary need to be able to do the same. My older daughter graduated last year and did her senior year almost fully remote. She did not like wearing a mask because MHS is hot enough without a mask on, let alone wearing one. The masks fit, make her feel like she can't breathe, as well as causing her face to break out. Teens have enough issues with their skin without a mask, so then wearing a mask, making it worse, affects their self-consciousness. My daughter felt like she was robbed of her senior year and all the activities that went along with it. She felt isolated because the only way for her to not wear a mask was to do remote schooling. We feel as though this took a toll on her mentally. The kids can take off their masks when they're outside for recess and play together. I know they're not always socially distanced because I've seen them play. Let them be kids and be free of masks. Kids are the least affected by the virus. They should not have the burden of worrying if they forgot a mask or they have to pull on every day for school. Please let us parents be the decision maker for our kids' health and safety. Don't take that away from us. I got stuck with one of my other papers. No worries. My name is Eric Van Winkle, Moline resident. I graduated from Moline. Daughter graduated from Moline. We have a sophomore and we have a freshman here. So, first, I want to say thank you to all of you because I firmly believe that you're all here because you want to do what's right for our kids and you want to do what's in their best interest. And sometimes what you think is in their best interest may differ with what other people think is in their best interest. So I appreciate the difficulty of the jobs that you have. I want to say that I also take COVID very seriously. I had it. My wife had it. It was terrible. It was not fun. It was three weeks of whole suck, okay? But we got over it. What you don't hear a lot about is natural immunity. That's right. So I want to bring up two points, natural immunity and why I think that we shouldn't be putting masks on our kids, okay? The other thing I wanna say is that there's a lot of data out there. Unfortunately, it seems like only certain data that fits a certain narrative gets presented to the general public. Exactly. And you have to look, it's not hard to find it, you have to look for it. So I wanna share a little bit of it with you in my five minutes. Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Months after recovering from mild cases of COVID-19, people still have immune cells in their body pumping up antibodies against the virus that causes COVID-19. According to the study, these cells could persist for, quote, a lifetime churning out antibodies. On the website MedPage today, World Health Organization released a scientific update stating that most people who have recovered from COVID-19 <coughs> develop a strong protective immune response. They summarize that within four weeks of infection, 90 to 99 percent of people who recover develop detectable neutralizing antibodies. The NIH reported in January of this year the immune response of more than 95 percent of people who recovered from COVID-19 had durable memories of the virus up to eight months after infection. And then get this, if SARS-CoV-2 immunity is similar to other severe coronavirus infections like SARS-CoV-1 immunity, that protection could last at least 17 years. And then to speak to the vaccination side of things, this data was presented to the Israeli Health Health Ministry. I understand that's not the US, but you get the point. <coughs> Health Ministry data on the wave of COVID outbreaks, which began this May, show that Israelis with immunity from natural infection were far less likely to become infected again in comparison to Israelis who had only immunity via vaccination. 
More than 7,700 new cases of the virus were detected. Roughly 40% of those new cases were people who were vaccinated. So we put all this focus, focus on vaccination, but we forget about those of us who have natural immunity, which by all means at least protects as much, if not more, than the vaccine. We all know the kids under 17 are at a much lower risk. From This is from the CDC, by the way. You can find this information yourself. From January of 20 to July 17th of this year, 337 kids died from COVID. 337. 819 kids died of pneumonia. This is an important point that I want to make. Some parents in Florida got together. They decided to send the masks of their children out for testing. <laughs> okay? They sent these to uh, University of Florida. It says, although the test is capable of detecting viruses, including SARS, only one virus was found in the mask, and it was not COVID. If these masks are stopping so much COVID, why isn't there COVID in the masks that are being tested? But you know what they did have? Half of the masks contained or contaminated with one or more strains of pneumonia causing bacteria. So we have 819 kids died from pneumonia, but we want to shovel masks on their faces and make them more susceptible to pneumonia. Sorry, I feel your time is up. my point's made. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I feel like I'm here for those people who have been able to really get the track shot in the paper. Okay, now we are on to number five public hearing of the proposed 2021 2022 school district budget. We will now begin the hearing of the proposed 2022 school district budget. Is there anyone who wishes to speak in favor of the proposed 2021-2022 school district budget? Is there anyone who wishes to speak in opposition of the proposed 2021-2022 school district budget? Is there anyone who wishes to speak neither for nor against? The proposed 2021-22 school district budget but wishes to offer additional information. If no public comment is hearing, the public we will now close the hearing of the proposed 2021-22 school district budget. The public comment, all testimony having been taken, this hearing of the proposed 2021-22 school district budget is now closed. Next is Dr. Savage with the ISD Health and Safety Guidelines and Usher Funding Plan for 2021-2022. Good evening, everyone. Um, I've got some information to share with you tonight. I wanted to provide a brief overview of our emergency funding uh, with the nickname ESSER. You have seen some of this information before. And all of this information is available on our district website as well. I wanted to use this opportunity as we launch into the new year to provide a few reminders and also speak a little bit about the health and safety guidance that is being brought forth um, by a number of different organizations. So the purpose for tonight's presentation is to re review the emergency federal funding and its uses, to provide an overview of our plan to fully open our schools, and to seek feedback and guidance from the Board of Education. And once these matters are concluded, then we want to be able to get some communication and information out to our parents as soon as possible for the start of the new school year. As a reminder, the district received three separate funding packages known as ESSER 1, 2, and 3. Um, ESSER 1 uh, was received last year, spring of 2020, and those, those monies have been applied for, received, and spent. ESSER 2 monies uh, were awarded last winter of 2020. The application has been received as well, uh, has been approved, and those funds have been received. ESSER 3 application just opened on July 1, and the district is in the process of navigating that application 
at this time. And I anticipate submitting that application sometime um, in August or early September. As you can see, um, here is the same slide that you have seen in previous presentations. Using color, I was able to bundle, bundle ESSER 2 and ESSER 3 together as the bulk of these funds are being used together to fund our two major priorities. Number one is our academic recovery process and hiring a significant number of certified teachers to assist us in the academic recovery process as well as a primary focus on ventilation in six current non-air conditioned schools. The bulk of those funds will be utilized for those two major projects. As you recall with ESSER 3, 20% of those funds must be dedicated towards the academic recovery process. As you can see here in detail, the two primary areas of focus for the bulk of those dollars are air conditioning for six non-air conditioned schools in our district as well as the hope to be able to provide upgrades to four current HVAC uh, systems that are uh, becoming outdated. And we have uh, completed the process of hiring approximately 50 new certified teachers to assist our already um, sound academic teaching and support staff to assist our students in the academic recovery process. There are some other expenditures there that would be secondary in terms of curriculum supp supplies and learning spaces around our schools. And again, all of this information is available on our district website. Just wanted to provide those reminders tonight as we are now working on our SR3 application and funding package. This slide is also recurring from a previous presentation. As I mentioned, and as uh, approved by the Board of Education, we will be working to uh, provide air conditioning in six schools over the next um, upcoming summers, uh, focusing on Adams, Butterworth, and Logan, ideally next summer, in the summer of 22, and in the summer of 2023, Lincoln Irving, Washington, and Jefferson. And the associated costs are there for your view as well. Keep in mind, I don't have to tell this Board of Education that these uh, timelines and uh, market is very fluctuating, but this is our goal, this is our plan. Launching into the new school year, again, our primary focus is on academic recovery, getting our students back in our school full time, five days a week for full school length days, so that we can begin the academic recovery process, as well as begin to assess and address our students' social emotional learning needs. Often you'll find that acronym SEL, social emotional learning needs that you'll see. And of course, all of that bundled with the health and safety that we have placed as a priority for all of our students for the past two years uh, during this pandemic. And our overall goal is to keep our schools fully open. Um, as you are aware, the State Board of Education has put a strong focus on in-person learning. The state superintendent, Dr. Ayala, has indicated to all districts that our primary focus is to get all kids back in school for in-person learning. And that is the goal of this district as well. Keeping again our schools fully open, that is the primary goal. We don't want to have any more school closures or district closures and do everything that we can to make that happen. And again, shooting for five days a week, full school length days. And again, the, the funding and the efforts and the resources are all dedicated towards an aggressive plan for academic recovery and addressing social, emotional, or SEL uh, learning needs. Limited offering for remote learning, as you are aware, the State Board of Education has also provided direction to districts in Illinois saying that remote learning should only be offered on a very limited basis, primarily for those students that would qualify for a traditional hospital homebound instruction, or for those students who have a physician that is able to sign a medical verification form indicating that they are medically at risk or someone in their family is deemed medically at risk. Um, if you recall, at the end of the year in May, we had 1,400 <coughs> students end the year in full-time remote learning, as at that time it was a parent choice. The State Department of Education had not placed any uh, rules upon which family could choose remote learning. As of now, we have only eight students across our entire district enrollment of well over 7,000 students fully enrolled in our full-time um, district remote learning academy. That means eight students 
have completed the application in Skyward and have had a physician sign a medical verification letter indicating that they or someone in their immediate household is medically at risk. We have had well over 200 students take that initial step and submit that application in Skyward. And so principals, as they are back to school this week, will be reaching out to those families to clarify their intent. Are they um, still anticipating full remote? Do they have a doctor's appointment scheduled? Was the application completed in error? Were they not aware they needed a medical verification letter? So those are some of the pieces that our principals are going to be working with these families over the next couple of weeks to clarify their intent so that we can have our families um, fully informed and teachers and principals can begin prepping for their class list. Moving into the health and safety recommended guidelines, districts across the state asked for local control and they got it. Um, however, um, guidance continues to come in and guidance continues to change. And here's sort of where we are at today. Um, the district has thoroughly analyzed the guidance for public schools as published by the CDC. I've got all of our little alphabet soup acronyms highlighted in green so you can see all of the different um, agencies and departments that are telling us how um, we need to be opening our schools. So the CDC put forth guidance for schools saying, uh, you know, speaking to social distancing, speaking to masking and the rules as they should be for folks that are vaccinated and folks that are not vaccinated. Um, shortly after that, the Illinois Department of Public Health and the Illinois State Board of Education, as we call it, is we both quickly adopted those school guidelines that CDC has put forth. Since then, we've been actively reviewing that guidance. We have sought consultation from the ROE, the Regional Office of Education, which is right upstairs, that supports 12 to 15 school districts in our region as well as LUDA, Large Unit District Association. As you know, the Moline-Cole Valley Schools is among the largest school districts in the state, the top 50. I believe we are number 27 in size out of 852 districts. So LUDA is an association and organization that provides guidance to districts of our size. As you know, districts of our size um, have a much more challenging time in making movements of opening schools and closing schools and social distancing and things of that nature. And also, of course, our own local health department, the Rock Island County Department of Health. We have been seeking consultation with them um, weekly for the past 18 months. Um, so prior to the last few days, it was my intent to recommend the CDC guidelines as were written, as the Illinois Department of Health and the State Board of Education quickly adopted those, those are the two primary entities that sanction us as school districts. Um, we are not directly sanctioned by the CDC, but we are by the Illinois Department of Public Health and of course the Illinois Department of Public Education. So when those two entities quickly adopted the CDC, then it was my intent and after discussion with our district executive leadership team, that it was in the best interest for me to stand before you and make that recommendation that we fully adopt the CDC guidance as is written. However, in the last couple of days, we have seen a lot of changes. And that is kind of where we are at in terms of launching the discussion with you all tonight. Um, I know Rock Island County Health has come forth with some recent guidance um, that is more mask um, restrictive, if you will, saying that schools need to be wearing masks. So we've got some changing guidance um, and that is the information that I have to kind of launch into the conversation with you tonight. Um, as I mentioned before, these are all of the different agencies that provide guidance to our district. Um, uh, I've got the Rock Island County vaccination rates there. I'm looking at this daily, as I know everybody in this room probably is, as well as our positivity rates. Uh, this is something that we have been monitoring every single day for the past 18 months. I've been reporting to you all, the Board of Education, weekly that entire time. Our vaccination rate, as I uh, understand this morning, was at 58% in our county. Of course, this is folks 12 and up. And the seven-day rolling average is now 3.1%. Keep in mind, the metrics for that are a few days lag. So the 20th is the most recent that I have. They're about three to four days behind. Um, and sometimes it takes them a little bit to get caught up over the weekend. So. That is the most recent um, information that I had. And of course, the CDC says 
Whatever school districts decide, layered mitigations can be added or taken away as cases increase or as vaccination rates increase. So whatever it is that we decide, it's not likely to be etched in stone because it's changing so often. So we may make decisions, they may change, new guidance may come along, we may have to adjust, but that has been the name of the game for the past 18 months. If that's something that we have learned and done is change, whether we like it or not, as painful as it was, we have, we have sort of rode the wave of the ebbs and flows of all of the different changing guidance. Um, our school district has offered a number of vaccination clinics. I am so grateful to our nursing staff in this district. Kudos to them. Thank a nurse. Um, healthcare providers across the nation have been our heroes, as well as our very own local school health link. They have worked directly with us, along with community healthcare, to help us provide these vaccination clinics for all of our staff. Our staff vaccination clinic was January 30th and February 27th for that first and second dose. And about 80 to 85 percent of staff chose to get their vaccination with us. I know many of other folks got their vaccination if they chose to do so someplace else. So our staff vaccination rate is high, and I believe that's what allowed us to keep our doors open as, as often as we were able to last year. We've completed two student, or we've almost completed two student vaccination clinics for kids 12 and up. We had a clinic on May 12th and June 2nd. Um, we had another new clinic that we started on July 15th, so kids could get their first dose. Again, this is total parent choice, and we had about 100, 150 kids each time sign up for those. The second dose for those kids will be on the 5th, and we have now instituted yet a third clinic, again, for parents that choose um, on the 5th, while well, that first bunch of kids will be getting their second dose, we are now able to offer that for first dose as well again, for 12 and up, as that's what's allowed. Again, total parent choice, but we wanna make it available and accessible for those families that want that resource. Um, again, total family choice. And then that second dose would be August 26th. And that was just confirmed in the last day or two. We have not even been able to get that information promoted out to families yet. So that messaging is coming out this week as well as sign up for opportunity. Um, as I mentioned, we are directly sanctioned by Illinois Department of Public Health, IDPH, and they are um, working on new guidance, surprise, as we speak regarding quarantine times and whether a student can test out of quarantine, meaning if they get identified as a close contact, can I, if my child gets identified, can I take my child to get a negative test, present it to the school so they don't have to quarantine? This is the information that I am seeking and that we are all waiting for at this time. And I think I saw some IDPH updates come through right before the start of the meeting. So we've got to go through those things. One thing I do know is vaccinated kids and adults will not have to quarantine. So if they are identified as a close contact, they will not have to quarantine. That is an IDPH, um, a rule that I'm aware of. Um, this is the information that I have today, again, um, I'm not a medical expert. I'm reading what I have and presenting it to you and um, keeping in mind that these things do change um, pretty rapidly and we're just trying to do our best to keep up with them. The CDC guidance um, that was recommended for schools and um, adopted by IDPH and um, the State Department of Education references. Excuse me, Dr. Savage, can you uh, hold on for a minute while we finish the conversation? Recommending three feet social distancing um, for our schools. That is going to be the measure that we are going to strive for, three feet social distancing as much as possible. That's what the guidance reads, distancing as much as possible. Um, and we ended the school year with three feet. We had our yardstick and we had principals and teachers and we were doing our best to get those seats as far apart as possible. But we're a big district and it's going to be a challenge, but that is our goal. The CDC recommends face coverings for unvaccinated staff and students and encourages parents to sort of take the lead in making that determination and policing that. However, we do know now that Rock Island Department of Health has changed their, their um, stance on that just in the last couple of days. Um, and we will have signage around the schools as we have for the past uh, year and a half. 
Busing is something that we do not have control over. It is considered public transportation or transportation. Students are required to mask on a bus as they are on a train or the metro or an airplane. That is not something that is up for choice as far as I understand. That is something that has been mandated to us. Personal hygiene, um, kids have gotten really good at washing hands and using hand sanitizer. We're gonna continue to teach, especially the littles, the importance of that and hand sanitizing it whenever they can't wash their hands before and after playing, before and after eating, all of those things. We've gotten, you know, kids have gotten really good at that. And I have to just say, kids have been amazing throughout this entire thing in terms of their their ability to cooperate and take all of these directions and follow all these weird rules that are new to all of us. They've really been amazing. And kudos to, kudos to all of the parents for assisting us with that. They've been awesome. Cleaning and sanitizing. We do have biotech foggers for manufacturer use. We will be fogging every school every 90 days. That's the manufacturer's suggested use. And so we will continue to do that uh, for the entire school year, including getting into every school and fogging before the start of school in late August. For uh, contact tracing, we will continue to do that. We have been contact tracing this entire time. It is an exhaustive process and kudos again to our nurses and our assistants from the health department who have helped us with that. Um, and I have those pieces in red there because we are waiting on new information about is it 10 days or 14 days for quarantine and can a child test out of quarantine with a negative COVID test? Those are some pieces that I'm waiting on um, as we speak. Instruction during quarantine, the State Department of, Head has really, of Ed has really clarified, I know that's a lot, uh, but I believe you have it in front of you um, as well or online. Um, we're really working with teachers to figure out how are we going to teach kids when they're home? And so you can read through that. Um, the process will look a little differently for a child that has qualified for full-time remote learning. We are not outsourcing that to a third party. We have hired additional certified teachers to teach our kids directly. Uh, so those kids, those eight as of now that are qualified will have a teacher working with them online. And then we've got some different procedures in place for kids if they have to quarantine. And what it'll look like for the littles will be different than what it'll look like for the middle school and the high school kids. Screening and testing. Um, we know that there are options for districts to provide testing, COVID-19 testing. We're really watching the guidance and see where things land. We do not have an intent at this moment to test kids. We have not um, sought that resource yet yeah, we've done a lot of investigation and research and we've got some opportunities in place if the board of education feels that that would be a mitigation that would be good for us but it's not something that we are intending on utilizing out of the gates we've got great partners with school health link they will be able to help us with that and we're really leaning on our medical providers in our community if a child needs to be tested for COVID-19 but that's really something to put a pin in we'll just have to see you know how the vaccination rates continue, how our positivity rates continue, this will be a work in progress, but not something that we're focusing on at this moment. Meals, um, I would like to say, I've got it in my later notes for at the end of the meeting. I'm very happy that um, the National School Lunch Program has waivers now for this entire school year. All meals will be free for all kids all year, which is fantastic. Um, and we are really going to encourage kids to eat and really try to have three feet social distancing in the lunchroom, whether principals get creative with how they stagger classes, whether they send some kids outside to play and then come in and eat and do that in smaller groups. I know some schools have certain classrooms eating in their classrooms, but that's something that we're working on so that we can try to manage that distancing piece. But again, we're a big district and everybody's gonna be working together for that. Communication, proud of the district's uh, Ability to keep our parents informed whether or not that there are that regarding the number of cases in our district that positive COVID case tracker has been on our district website for a year and a half and it didn't get taken down. We ended the year with 332 cases, I believe, and we'll start that tracker over at the beginning of the year. 
We've got a communication protocol to where we're informing those folks that are directly involved with a close contact and trying to work with their principals so that the people that need the information get the information. And that has been a massive undertaking, but something that we're working really, really hard on. Uh, working on improving communication is something that is never done. So lastly, I know that's a lot of information. I apologize. It's my hope that we work through these decisions collaboratively, as I feel we always do with the Board of Education. And whether we require masks or recommend masks, in my opinion, it will not be as challenging as it was to close our schools. For a superintendent, that was the most awful decision to have to make. Um, I had tears at night. I have kids in college. It was awful for them. I'm a parent, and I get it. And those are awful, awful decisions. And I felt so much for our parents, especially our parents with younger students who are who need assistance in their learning. Those decisions were awful. And I never want to have to make that decision again. Um, so for me, my priority is whatever it's going to take to keep our schools fully open, keep our doors open five days a week for full school length days. And that is all the information I have. So I will be happy to take questions or guidance from the board. All right, before we start going around, I just in the interest of transparency and clarity, want everyone to understand that right now, this is much of a discussion item in the agenda. So we may not necessarily be voting, we are just discussing. And when the board discusses, it is not open to the audience to discuss that with us. It is just our open discussion together. So, um, Andy, I'm going to start with you. <coughs> Sorry. Thanks. Do you want to flip the coin? Oh, all right. So, um, thank, you. thank you for your presentation. Like you said, this is one of the most important decisions that uh, this board has had to make. So, I applaud you as we, as we kind of go through this. Um, if we are going to make mask optional, how do you enforce uh, the for the parents that want their kids to wear masks? Is it the teacher's responsibility, or uh, what kind of enforcement mechanism is that? I think enforcement would be a challenge. I think that's a really good point to bring up. Um, I believe the guidance, as it places the responsibility on the parent, then rests that authority to police with the parent. But it does make it very difficult in the school for a teacher to know or for other kids to know. So enforcement would be very difficult. It would be an honor system. It would be a system that would be driven by the parents. Again, imperfect. It is imperfect. And the Rock Island County Health Department is recommending um, masks, as is the American Academy. That is correct. Okay, so go ahead, Maria, for your first round. I'm going to go. Thank you, Dr. Satton, for your presentation for the um, COVID, I mean, regardless of where it is, I'm wearing a mask. I'm vaccinated. You didn't have to know that, but I just told you because there's a lot of people. COVID is very personal to me. My mother passed away from COVID. Right? Have you lost your mom, your dad? I don't want your kids to lose their grandparents, okay? Or their mom, or their sisters, or their brothers, okay? Um, but I'm also a parent. My daughter graduated from here, my son did too. And I have nephews and nieces and friends that have kids in, in school here, elementary as well. I want to, you know, you are the parent, yes. Okay, you know what's best. Like, I know what's best for my kids. So if I had the choice to send my kids, I would send them with the mask optional. Okay? I don't want to be the one responsible for something happening to your kid. It's, it's, you know, responsible for whatever it may be, their death in this case, or COVID. Because COVID does kill. If I have lived it, it'll be a year of this August 12th that my mom passed away from COVID. She didn't have any prior health conditions. She was older. She died at 69, but she had no health issues, no heart issues, no diabetes. Okay, my dad was the one that had two heart attacks, and he's 70, 71. But COVID got her and another cousin also, and friends from here in Quad Cities as well, 52 years old. So it does kill. 
The only thing I want is the safety of your, your kids, my kids, my nephews. Um, and it really, really does hurt me. Um, everybody has different opinions, but um, I really feel strongly that it is the parent's choice. But at the same time, you know, I'm sitting on this board and I have to make this decision. Yeah, it is. It's hard that it has to land on us. Um, I will do what's best for your kids, for my kids, for the whole community. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Uh, you are out. Well, I appreciate what you just said, Maria, as far as um, being mindful of not only our students, but also our community. I think that's an important thing to take into consideration. And thank you, Dr. Savage, for everything you put together and all the time you've dug through all the paperwork and ins and outs. Um, it, it's not an easy decision. Um, I work in a hospital. I'm required to wear a mask when I'm outside of my office or with any of anyone who's unvaccinated. So, um, you know, it's a requirement for me. Uh, it's not a fun thing for any of us. My gut would be to go with what the guidelines are for from Rock Island County. Um, I think they have a better handle of what's going on in our community than a lot of places do would be my gut instinct and um you know i can't say i'm gonna quote dr spock about the needs of the few or the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few i'm gonna skip myself so i can sum everything up as the president uh, audrey i'm gonna have you so i uh, audrey go ahead so um i guess i'm going in when the guidance myself is left from the Rockland County Health Department and knowing kind of what's happening in our community. And once again, like the permission, I'm, I'm wearing a mask. I'm fully vaccinated, but I also uh, work with and have neighbors that are being you know, compromised. And um, and I know that our vaccination rate is around 50% of this community. And yet I can look here, I can look at the store when I go, and not near 50% of people are wearing masks, um, which means that the people that are unvaccinated are actively choosing the outdoor um, without masks on uh, at risk of spreading things to other unvaccinated or to individuals who might carry it. Um, and, that, and that's my worry is that um, in, in our community, we have that. And, and unfortunately, you know, it saddens me that I've lost a lot of trust in my community members. Um, but at the same time, I trust experts. I trust people who have spent their whole life um, in public health and science. You have whatever professions we have represented out here. If you are a mechanic, I trust that you're an expert at that. If you are an attorney, I trust that you are an expert at that. And so these individuals that have spent their life either, you know, with a vaccine coming up with us to prepare, or are our doctors and physicians or public health experts, I trust them and knowing that that guidance has come out recently. Um, and the CDC guidance I know would be great. I have two kids that are vaccinated and they were super excited thinking maybe they won't have masks this fall. But then they said, what about all of the people that likely are going to come that are not vaccinated that are going to sit next to me and that I'm going to bring this, I might be a carrier even though I don't get sick and I might bring it back to my grandfather who is immunocompromised. And that's not a risk they're willing to take. So they're going to stay masked even though they're vaccinated. Um, and so it just, it saddens me for at this point, quite honestly, in our community and in our country, when I think they're as well, very, very much available. Um, and so uh, right now we have to make these decisions. And so I think um, I would lean toward, I'm curious. Um, I know you mentioned we might have spoken to the NDH today. I'm curious about um, feedback from our faculty, our staff and our teachers. If you have any, any thoughts or anything you'd like to share about what they have to say. The only thing that they had shared, and it was a brief conversation, was that they really hadn't heard from many staff. So they didn't have a lot of input from their membership but also that they expected that we would follow the CDC guidance. That was really the only um, takeaways. Um, there was talk about uh, masking at the elementary level, what that might look like. Um, and our elementary representative really just spoke to the most important thing is keeping the schools open. So that's how the conversation ended. And I guess, I think there is, and I look at the, the CDC and IDPH guidance and I see um, the word should is in there. And I think people are interpreting that that in a lot of different ways. Right. Um, and when I read it, I think should, that means if you're not vaccinated, you're younger and anybody at middle and high school, 
then they should be wearing a mask. And then, then that puts it on our teachers and our staff to craft and to be able to do that, which I think logistically is a nightmare. Um, and so the easiest way I think to keep our people's, my kids, your kids, our community, our the rest of our, our people face is to follow the, the New Rock Island County guidance. Um, at least at, at the beginning, and we see where it goes. Like you said, none of this is said in stone. It's all very malleable based off of, of circumstances. But right now, that seems to be what our local health experts are telling us to do. Thank you. Justin. Thank you. <clears throat> well, I understand and agree completely over the last year and a half. We've listened and followed to our sanctioning bodies like we need to. And that's the appropriate thing to do. Currently, those sanctioning bodies, the State Board of Education and the State Health Department, have still left it up to optional or required for the local district. Well, if they move to saying that we should, that we need to require or, rec or um, enforce, then absolutely we follow their recommendations as they are sanctioning bodies, and that's what we're supposed to be obligated to do with this properly operating district. But when we look and we hear Science by itself is designed to be challenged, questioned, poked and prodded, and adjusted. And we hear all sides of masks are okay, masks help, they don't. And then we hear scientists, universities, and studies also say the opposite. And they've all got their reasoning to that. What I haven't seen from any of them is numbers and data that support masking the children. Exactly. They, they don't support masking the healthy. Most of the children are. There's no evidence that the mask stops COVID in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't stop lots of things. Sure. In every pandemic that comes around, is it the first thing gone to? Yes. Do they usually last about two years? Yes. That's normal history. I would like to think 100 years since the last time we really needed them, we'd be a little different. But here we are, 18 months later, still talking about whether they need, are needed or not. It is the first line of defense. A lot of it is because they don't know what else to do when the first, first thing needs decided. So put up a barrier. When we put up the barriers, we've also, if we're going to work on social and emotional side of things as well, the anxiety, the depression, the suicide, the lack of self and self esteem and self confidence, the lack of individuality is gone when we cover. That has caused record numbers of problems in the mental health areas for our students across the country. Do I know our specific numbers here in town? No. But when we look, well, masks might have. From a tunnel vision of medical only, I've got blinders on, and that's the only thing I can think, which is what the medical experts are speaking from. Yep. They don't have the experience nor the expertise from the other side of it, from the mental health doctors, from the bacterial growth that grows in here as the kids wear them. Do we have that problem? No. Do we still have to wear them at work? Lots of us do. Did we have to wear them over the last year? I think just about all of us did. Can we control that? Can we can we keep our masks clean? And depending on what we're currently doing in your occupation, sure, much more than a child. But children know they do this and they do this, and the bacteria grows. And there's and the more sicknesses of other kinds happened this last year than any other year when we weren't masking. Now, I found it interesting that we had absolutely no influenza numbers in cases whatsoever. Well, we yeah, had COVID so masks, so we have no idea what they're, but masks can and do help influenza. That's not as small and micro, micro in, nature, in, in existence in nature yeah. as COVID. But we don't ever sit here and talk about in any district, not just ours, in anywhere, about masks being required to stop the normal routine things. Unfortunately, once a virus is here, it's here. COVID will become a normal something we can get, and protections will come to mitigate that. Lots of some are already here. Some people are taking advantage of it. Nearly 60% of, of our community. None of those point to the kids being at the risk. 
none of that points, and I've seen absolutely no data anywhere in my own research, nor in, nor in media, nor in, this, nor in speeches given. I, I watch and read and listen to a lot from all types of sources. I've never seen medical data yet to support the requirement for, for children. I've not yet seen the medical data that the children are the ones that are the most susceptible to COVID. If, if 80% of our staff is vaccinated and they would be least susceptible, then if the vaccines work, they're good. Students can't get them. Students don't need the vaccines. Also, these are experimental vaccines still. That's right. The idea that everybody has to have it to operate when it's an experimental is just beyond the norms. If we, if I, if I was normally sick enough to possibly need an experimental drug, it's usually the last thing before I'm just going to give up and give in to, and succumb to whatever I'm battling. That's not how this one's being treated. I don't know why. If there's your, there, it's safe. It seems good. It seems safe. It was developed by the same company, same, same process, same oversight, same testing. Everything that's created all the other vaccines in history, this went through the same process. No reason to doubt it. But why push it on somebody? Why, why discriminate? Mask or no mask, if we're going to make it something, I, I request that we make it even for everybody. Either everybody does or everybody don't. Otherwise, we're discriminating now. And then people talk, well, what about divisions? Well, if we start dividing even more, well, you, you fit this group, you're over here. You that this group we're causing divisions more than more than avoiding them by not having the rules equal. And my last thought on this clearly on for optional masks. I have no problem for those who want to wear them. I personally have no problem if you choose not to. This is America. We are based on liberty and freedom. Liberty says let the parents continue to choose. Yes, the health information is out there. Yes, advice is out there. Recommendation is not requirement. Should is, I think you should, from my viewpoint, with this information. But that's a one viewpoint thing. I don't know your other, I don't know your other factors in your life that make a decision for you. I think we can cause a great breach of liberty, a great slap in the face of our parents. If we take their freedom of choice away for their children, Thank you. where there is no statistic whatsoever that points at the kids needing the mask and that they're actually doing any good for them. Thank you. I'm going to start with a question. Uh, we talked about the negative test being a way out of quarantine. Do we have any idea when we're going to kind of hear any guidance with that? I'm speaking as a parent who I had my eighth grader last year, got COVID for the end of the school year, um, and my fourth grader at the time tested negative, but was actually out of school for longer, which was a very difficult thing. Um, I understood the process, it just seemed out of the main. So I wasn't sure if we have any idea of when we're gonna kind of hear what the recommendations are for that. I'm anticipating any day. In fact, right before the meeting, I have a couple of emails in my inbox that I think might be that, but I haven't had a chance to take a look at it. But I'm being told any day. Um, and then, so I've I've waited back and forth on this. I I work construction. I wore a mask until I was vaccinated working construction and it was terrible and it was hot and it was no fun. I did it. So I I know how much they sucked. I also know that my kids will continue to wear their masks this time. But as I've kind of gone back and forth and thought about things, at the end of the day, we work for the parents and for the students. Thank you. And like I stronger recommend getting vaccinated, wearing a mask. I really do. My children will continue to. My children that are eligible are scheduled to be vaccinated. My youngest will continue to wear a mask. 
we still wear masks often, even though we're vaccinated. But I think at this time, uh, I think we need to have, we recommend, but they are optional. I don't think we can go with, if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear one, because that is very hard to enforce. You know, a parent or a teacher isn't going to know offhand seeing a kid walking through a hallway whether or not they're back. I think that that's a very, very hard thing to enforce. It puts more on the teachers if we put it in the hands of the parents with the understanding that should guidelines come down from the state, at that point, our hands are cut. But I thought now it was, I was last week and a half, but my thought now is give it to the parents with the understanding that things can change overnight. Thanks, Ken. Okay, so I'm just gonna kind of break that. Um, the CDC is currently saying that if you are unvaccinated, you should wear a mask. Um, the Rock Island Health Department is now saying, um, as of today, see, I read the article and got the verification that they are saying K through 12, no matter what, should be masked. The Ameri American Pediatric Group is following the same thing, or actually, I believe Rock Island County is following the American Pediatric um, and here is how I feel. I want to protect every single child, but I am not here to protect one child. It is my job to protect all children, just like we have other safety protocol in place that we do to keep kids safe at school. Um, and my recommendation would be, particularly for the elementary kids, to be fully masked. However, I am not comfortable making a decision tonight when there is guidance coming down. I think it is jumping into a fire that we don't have <laughs> the full information yet. Uh, the IDPH is sending another email. They are talking about the CDC is getting is talking about changing the recommendation and updating it. I would like to wait a little bit until that information comes down. Um, I do agree with Justin. I think we can't play that you wear them, you don't wear them. I think that's a disaster for our teachers. And I do think it will cause all sorts of problems. Um, I just don't feel like we should decide tonight and then on Friday or Monday, they're like, we are gonna undo it. So I am more comfortable. We have had this discussion. Everyone thinking about what they heard waiting for Dr. Savage to update us on what the IDPH says and what the CDC is changing. And I am suggesting a special board meeting next week that is solely for the vote on that. That is my recommendation at this time. Questions, feelings? I'm gonna throw you to the alligators, Aaron. All right. I think we should follow the same guidance and process that we did throughout the last 18 months. We fought tooth and nail to be as open as possible for our sanctioning bodies guidelines. Now we're sitting here saying, well, we may we may be more restrictive than our sanctioning bodies guidelines. I don't really think we should be more than that. Or we stay with what they are. There are guidance. Our sanctioning bodies are the State Health Department and State Board of Education. I I don't even think we necessarily need votes here and there. 
I think we follow our sanctioning bodies' recommendations. They listen to all of those other sources as well, filter that, and send it down to us. And they're who we answer to, and they're who we're tied legally to follow. That's where I would stand, leave it, is currently they're saying it's optional. Let it be optional. Let the parents have, it, have the freedom. I'm sorry. That's the fourth time we've been interrupted. I don't have any authority to actually move anybody, but I will ask people to leave next time that they interrupt. Um, if, if they say if they come out after CDC says something or more, more around the state happens, and then our sanctioning parties say, no, you guys need masks. If we currently follow a path to have a vote of saying yes or no, and then they change guidance, we have to have another vote. Then we have to have another vote. I say follow their guidance. If they say it's optional, let us be optional. Let us be as open as we can be, which is what we promised our community we would be for the last until tonight, 18 months and shy of it. Tonight we're sitting here asking ourselves whether we should be more restrictive or not. We promised them we'd be as open as we could. We promised we'd be as free in liberty as we could. Our sanctioning bodies are saying it's optional. I say we stick with them. If they ever move to require, then we move with them because that's the, because that's what we do. So you're saying if, if the guidance is that it's optional, and I think that is an interpretation of the word should, masks should be worn indoors by all individuals they do know before are not fully vaccinated, is what the current guidance there says. And so I think that is not saying masks are optional, that's saying. Um, and, so, and so I think that interpretation of it, um, it to me, even with the CDC guidelines, is saying that, and then that puts our our staff in a position of checking people's potential vaccination status for our older students that are vaccinated and figuring out who is in the system. And that I think is, like I said, a logistical nightmare. And, um, and I don't think, in terms of any sort of honor system with that, I don't, I don't trust that that would work. Um, and so, and also, um, yeah, so I think that just coming on that there. And I think just the uh, guidance then of, of listening to our local health department experts still and I do agree we could share those that we heard a lot of things tonight and I want to take those into consideration. And we heard a lot of things via email from people over the last several days. Um, and so I think taking some time to reflect on that, see what other guidance comes down, allows us to make the best decision possible for our students and our community. Um, and so I don't think potentially a vote on something, but I do think potentially a vote is needed because there is disagreement about what is the best thing. Okay, Miss Kate and then Andy. I don't believe we voted in past on whether or not to make this. So I don't think that that's a practice we want to. Okay. I think, I mean, I think that they can look back and get me wrong, but I don't believe that that's anything we, we voted on in the past. I think we we followed the guidelines, and I think that's pretty much what we need to do. Okay. But I mean, I think um, we look, I don't think this is really a question at the uh, middle school. They have the option to get the, um, the vaccine. That's, uh, that, that is parent choice. That's absolutely parent choice. My kids are little. You don't have the option. My kids are five and eight. It's not an option for us. Um, so the, the K through six is really where, where I think I struggle with that. Uh, because there are a lot of things to, to balance on. And we're volunteers. Okay, I'm, a, I'm in the construction industry, but all I get, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a pediatrician. Uh, you know, I listen to my pediatrician. So, I mean, uh, uh, I think a really significant point that Audrey is we have to listen to the experts. We have to listen, I listen mechanically, I don't need to get my own I listen to uh, the 
you know, not bringing the engineer because of the out of the land. I would listen to experts in their field. I would listen to Chet and talk to my boy. Not call you. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, we need to, to be open to that and listen to that and be respectful of that. I don't know, struggle at that, that K to six. And, and I, I don't think we, we can't. Second people's vaccine status is out of the question. We can't do it. It's, it's not. Uh, well, you need to look more into it. That's not, that's not what it is, but I do. Uh, that's not something we're, we're going to do. It's not ethical. It's not. It's that K through six that are really strong. But they don't have the option. Parents don't have an option. I don't have an option to vaccinate my children against COVID. And uh, so I, I really struggle with that. And we have always followed what the CDC says. I mean, and um, I don't believe we as a board, I mean, as I've been sitting here, voted on that. And um, I agree, it's, it's your, the parents' choice. You know, they want to send their kid to school and they're sick with the fever or a bad cough. Um, no, you're going to school, suffocate, you have to go to school. I, I, I agree, it's a parent's choice if they want to send their kids with the mask or not. But we just need to follow what the CDC and what the experts say. Okay, we're going to try to lock down into a narrative. Um, the reason I propose to go only is. Because if we are not together, I don't know how we give Rachel guidance. That's that's all I'm getting at. If I don't want it to be that she's picking what individual board members to listen to, as opposed to that's I just feel like that we're putting our administration in a weird position. That's that is why I recommend. My fear is, I agree, the CDC knows what they're doing. <laughs> you know what? Right. You know what? They asked at the very beginning for respect and to show the values of our community. No one in our board acts like this, even when we disagree with each other. If you cannot follow our values, we are asking you to leave. This is a meeting held in the public, it's not a public event. It's uncalled for. Um, not to make light of it, but I almost feel like everyone's become an English teacher and is interpreting the word should. That is my struggle. Everyone has a different idea of what should means. Um, and so that is my struggle when we say, well, the CDC says it's optional. And then somebody else sees that as the CDC is telling you, you should wear a mask. Um, that is why I would be hoping that maybe we could wait because I know guidance is coming and I know Rachel has IPHE, you know, I, that was my hope for the, the, the waiting. I agree with Amy. I don't know what to do from seventh grade to 12th grade. It is not appropriate for us to ask for vaccination records for the, the COVID. I don't want our staff to police that, even though I personally would like the mask. I do not believe we can send our elementary students unmasked if they have no vaccine choice. And my interpretation of CDC they should is they should wear them. So my struggle is we've heard all of this. Last weekend, 
Yeah. Right. Queen Rachel do this to Dr. Savage. So that's kind of where I'm at with this. Go ahead. I agree with waiting to make, make a final thought. And if we want to wait to see how the guidelines come down, if the guidelines come down more restricted, that's that. If the guidelines still come down with room to something, <laughs> then maybe we do need to reconvene for further discussion, but to schedule a vote on it, I think is a little too much. Right. And that's a, I'm just make sure I understand. Could we? <clears throat> So what you're saying is, hold off. We get further guidance, it comes, we have a discussion again, and from that discussion, the recommendation comes, but not with the vote, that's what you're saying. Yes. Okay, just make sure I understand. Okay. Andy and then Kate. Okay, I'm just, I'm thinking this out, right? Okay, so. Go ahead, we're puzzle it. Okay. Uh, if a child is not able to tolerate a mask, the physician could write a, a note that could be accepted as an online care, correct? Correct. Right. Right. I think that's an important point. All right, I have another point. Okay. Okay. Um, I looked up the word should. You see the obligation, duty, or practice to remove British ID from his action. Used to indicate what is probable. That's what the dictionary said. Um, but <laughs> my thought, <laughs> just sorry, my, um, sorry, my, much like Trust would think that we should um, wait, I would call it almost like a game time decision. We wait and we um, maybe are what we. Ask um, Dr. Savage to do is we feel as a board, and I'm I'm not saying this is what we feel. I'm saying if we if we make a consensus to say we as a board feel we should follow CDC guidelines, and that is what she would do. You know, CDC guidelines at the day we start school is you have to wear a mask if you're you know K five, then that would be the guidelines. And I know we want to have that information out to, to parents immediately um, or ahead of time, but I also think that it's a learning curve right now, so we don't know. Check. Um, so I agree with that. I think one thing we need to really nail down is weird to say is the word should. Because um, I know when you do with, with contracts, a lot of times there's between should and shall. Yeah, right, exactly. And that's where I think we're getting hung up is yeah. shall that you shall wear that mask, should as you should wear that. Mm -hmm. And it's so I think that's something when we start looking at it, if we're going with the CDC or you know the Department of Public Health. When we start getting hung up on something like that or its interpretation, I think we need to nail it down. And I, from what I've dealt with a lot, it's the difference between should and should. If they said you shall wear a mask, then you, you do it. So I'm all for waiting, waiting to see um, what what we see as we get closer, which I mean, it, I looked maybe three weeks, give or take, when we started school, which feels like we're as close as we want to be, but with something that's been changing as often and as sometimes drastically as this has been, I think we kind of still see you know what what the people who really kind of dictate what we do have to say is being closer and if they say if you're on that you should wear a mask and we say you should wear a mask i don't recommend you do but it's a <laughs> i didn't mean it like that it's like i decided at the same time where i thought um so that's that's where i'm at it's <clears throat> Very tough choice that's been kind of set in our laps. You know, we we said it numerous times. You know, not a single one of us is an expert on any of this. Try to you try to figure out what's true and what isn't. And I'm not that smart of a guy. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> so so that's why I'm at. And, 
I hate to make it sound like the decision is let's not make a decision, but I think it's really hard to make a hard and fast rule while we're still seeing different things. I agree. Can I ask for consensus? Can I want to ask for consensus to the board about willing Oh, yeah. They gave me the gavel. Um, can I get consensus that we would like to process what we were we heard tonight and wait for further guidance before we move on? Do we want to set up a special board meeting to continue this discussion? What is our next? What's our next public meeting? Um, yeah, so oh, we would be okay with the board. Okay, Andy, go ahead. Going out there. Nor will I. I will be really close to tomorrow, but I can't hear. Well, Andy, Justin, and Chet, when will you be in town next week? Any day after Monday. Can we do Wednesday plus Friday? Can we do Right. Work. But work. work. That's still two weeks out. We don't necessarily have to get into next week. We could do this the first week of August. Or so the ninth, the ninth, the ninth or tenth. Can I? When does school start? I will be back. I will be here on the tenth. I'm so full of life. Um, I'm gone the week between the ninth and the thirteenth. Okay. But I am available third, fourth, and fifth next week. I can do fourth or fifth. I bet you, Maria. I'm available. We go back to school on Thursday. <laughs> yes, you will. I have to go back to school. Friday right. 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 is Thursday, and Andy right. said not till Friday. Yeah, so. I will. I will not be back. And I won't be here on. Well, Thursday. I'll be back Thursday. At the very most, could you phone in? Yes. Yeah, Face time right. you. Right here. I want to be an all. Um, how yes, does every, every, did everyone feel about the six? Five. That's a Five. Friday. That's, you're right, the fifth. I should be back in town by like this time. Okay. So <laughs> Thursday, August 5th be at six o'clock.
They are real private. They are all real. All real. <laughs> all right. Number nine is our approval of risk management plan. The recommended motion is that the Board of Education approves the Maine Full Valley School District. Number 40, risk management plan for the 2021 2022 school year. So, any discussion? Any heard none? Hey, Shaper. Aye. Maria S. Trigueros. Aye. Andrew Weyer. Aye. Andre Adamson. Aye. Justin Anderson. Aye. Chet Smith. Aye. Aaron Walden Smith. Aye. Superintendent reports requests and open the question to board members. Dr. Savage, you are up. You have in front of you a copy of our draft new district strategic goals, our PACE goals. As you know, we follow the acronym People, Achievement, Community, and Environment. And we took a lot of time and reviewed the notes from the Board of Education brainstorming session that was held back in May. And we were able to gather together those notes along with the um, goals from last year that were carried over due to the pandemic and we were able to uh synchronize those two efforts and put together these draft goals for this year as you can see we've got two goals for people two for achievement two for community and two for environment i won't take the time uh, to read them all word for word but the people goals continue to focus on recruitment and retention of highly qualified and diverse staff. We um, have had that goal for quite some time. We want to branch out and make sure that we're posting our positions in places where all stakeholders in our community and abroad can see those positions. So we want to get creative and we want to expand how and where we're posting those positions. This is also an extension of our Grow Your Own program, which we're really excited to get started with this year. Over 25 students, I believe, are signed up for the first cohort of Grow Your Own, and that is so exciting. So we're really focusing on recruitment and retention in our district and want to make sure that our staff is, is representative of our students. The other people goal is really focused on professional coaching. Um, a lot of what we learned last year was that our staff is asking for more resources and more coaching to be able to navigate conversations focused on students' social emotional needs. And that's something that we're going to focus on with our people goal. For achievement, we've got our work uh, laid out for us. We are going to uh, really target our math assessments in the fall and really be able to pinpoint where the learning occurred and where the learning was unfinished. I don't want to say it didn't happen. Teachers continue to teach and kids continue to learn. And the um, data is showing that um, from our spring assessments. So we're really going to invest in those fall assessments, make sure that kids that need extra support are targeted, have a plan in place, utilizing our academic recovery teachers, but also not only focus on the intervention piece. We want to always make sure that we're looking at the gifted piece as well. And so we piloted an assessment in the spring, the Nagliari, and we're just looking at those results and want to make sure that our students at all levels of achievement are getting what they need to learn and grow. The second achievement goal is focused on career pathways. We know that this is a priority for our Board of Education. We've got a number of programs in place and we want to expand that. So we're really going to be looking to our community to assist us with that and not only what career pathways would they like our students to have more um, exposure and pre-service pre experiences, but also engaging those folks and helping us make some of those decisions. So that is our achievement work. For community, um, we have the chance to really see how the parent mentoring program can positively affect our schools. That program is phenomenal and it is growing. Our schools that have the parent mentor program receive over 25,000 hours of volunteering and support services over the last year. They are an amazing bunch of people and we're looking to expand that. But also we wanna know why um, folks that are having trouble engaging with us um, are having trouble engaging with us. Is it not at the right time? Is it not at the right um, rate? Is it not the right frequency? Is it not the right topics? 
So we also want to ask our parents directly and find out what can we do to make it easier for you to engage with us and be involved with your students. So looking at parent engagement across the board. And then the other community goal is focusing on QC businesses in particular. I know the chamber will be useful for us in that regard to help us attract more business support in engaging with our students for workplace readiness. And our two environment goals are really focused on social emotional learning, not only for all of our students with the assessment that we piloted last year, but also with our students in our alternative education program. So that is really the overarching synopsis of those goals. And I would ask the Board of Education just to send me any feedback or any changes um, so that we can launch these at the start of the school year. When would you like? Anytime. I mean, like, what do you want to Give me a day. A week. Before your vacation. Yes. Yeah. 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 A week would be great. Um, we do have our um, administrators coming together for the first time on August 10th, and we do like to really launch those goals at that time. That is wonderful. Oh. Yes, one, one thing I know you mentioned the chamber thing, so definitely send it yes. to the town looks like they just completed. I know that's the area yes. of it, but uh, I just read an interesting article today talking about the teaching cultural exchange program in the Peoria School District and how that we have difficulty to affect the teachers, but I know we're trying to affect. More representation of diverse mm -hmm. teachers. And so they're using different through ISBE, where you can have teachers come from a variety of countries and, and some school research just we feel kind of lack of teachers are definitely leaning on that, but that might be something for us in terms of the diversity of things to consider. I thought it just looked really and that's in Peoria. Uh, Peoria is doing that right now. They're very heavily they have a lot of different really tiered recruitment efforts for um, just filling needs and also diversity and um, with their staff and stuff. I think that's like Ask about, but also I know ISB evidently sponsors that program. I will uh, just a feedback. I ran into an East Moline school board member, uh, and they were telling me about that East Moline is getting ready to launch the parents uh, mentorship program, and that they had reached out to me. They have nothing but fantastic. That's great. Um, Mr. McDermott. All I want to tell you is that the reports you normally get for June are you never get one just because we're going to close out with the external auditors. So the next month, the external auditors will close that out. And so you won't really get a report until October, the first of October, and I'll show you everything how we closed out the year. So just FYI. Okay, so it's the Board of Education Review of Established Norms. And how we, we decided to deal with this is I sent, I sent, I have a bunch of stuff for you to look at our structure and our norms. What we would like you to do is to overlook them, make changes, things you want to add, um, look at the structure. You have questions about the structure. Is there a way we can make it more specific? So um, we as board members are going to be specifically should for quicker information to our community. Um, so you have homework. I'm going to go over this. I'm going to give you a date, Andy. <laughs> I need it to <laughs> If it's not a deadline, it piles up for later. I want you to go through this stuff um, and on our meeting this August 23rd at our meetings. Yes, okay. We will actually go through this stuff and set our norms. Um, I'm also asking the group to bring that little book that they gave us. Um, this one? Yes, thank you. Um, this is a really, really good time for us to establish who we are in the board. Um, and this has been excellent work for us in the past, and it has been our guiding principles. So um, that's your homework. We look at that, work on that, be ready to talk about it. Yes, I have a request um, with the general school administration. Mm -hmm. 
groups. Oh, the organizational yes, chart. Assistant superintendent for elementary teaching and learning. Okay. Is that Google Google or is that? Google. Google. Yeah, but, I, but what I'm saying is that sometimes I look at that and go, I don't know if that's. I can Google. Google. Or if that's. And I think that is something that's important for organizational practice. Can we have both? Can we have one that has like a title mm -hmm. and one that has one that's not official or like. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just to maybe a guide. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, I just don't. I mean, because of the yes, sir. yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Yes, that's fine. I just I work in the same way. Forms, I do that. I don't know. Okay, before we move on, is there any other items that we need to discuss? Yes, this is going to involve data. Okay. Hey, the property that was your message about. We can't clearly we can't just go and say, yeah, you can buy this. No, we can't. Remember, we have to go through an RFP process. A public auction. Yeah, public auction. So is there but is there a reason why we wouldn't go through that process right yes. now? Given the 10 year plan. Yes. Okay. 10 year plans sometimes take longer than 10 years to implement. So in 08, Logan was on the non- you know, future use. However, there's so much parking needs there that is the reason why that was bought originally. There was two parcels. The letter was a little bit somewhat misleading. There was a house taken down that was making it, making it made into a parking lot. There's one that's kitty corner from that. There, so there's two houses. Here's Logan. We walk there every day. I'm very yeah, familiar. you're familiar. <laughs> so it's not contiguous to our property, so we yes. could not make it a parking lot. I don't know flashbacks from a few years ago. So, but if we were able to buy the next prop, either one of those other properties directly, to yes, the to, to the south, this individual, you know, lives at that property. Yes, lives the at one that is contiguous. next to yeah, and next to the driveway. Okay. So. Uh, you know, we reached out to her before she, her husband has asked before uh, and i think it to you really get to the point a little closer to uh exiting that property you don't want to give up that land it's maintained well we maintain it well um what about the garage the garage that has we, and we could there's a lot of we tear it down yeah we could tear it down for minimal and we're looking into that less than minimal twelve hundred dollars Probably a little bit more than that, but probably not. Twelve hundred dollars. <laughs> well, you're an expert, so I, I no, know. But no, you're probably very close. We do not think it'll be a lot. But sometimes, mm -hmm. sometimes they leave the garages there for the buildings to use, and sometimes they use them, and sometimes they forget about them. And, and and that's what we've done. We have a property right adjacent to us in Washington. We left the garage there for the building purposes. We and sometimes it reduces the need for another shed. <laughs> but the same thing at Franklin, we there's a there's a garage there from a house we bought. Same thing at the Lincoln Irving site. So it's not it's not unusual. But yeah, for this case, we'll look into that and get it. But you know, my recommendation is you know, wait at this point because you're gonna have to do a public auction and there's no you know that person could be the bidder or the winner, but it's it's not gonna go for a lot. And the congestion around Logan is as bad as any school. So if you could get another 15 or 20 cars off that off the streets, that would be a safety issue for the kids. So I'm saying my recommendation was yet in the future, hey, you know, keep on asking. But for right now, do you have an exit strategy plan? I, I would be hesitant to, to give up that real estate. Is there any utilities at that garage? <laughs> okay. 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 Anything else before we move on? Okay. Number 11 is making it close. This is to consider the litigation when an action against affecting or on behalf of a particular public body has been filed and is pending before a court or an administrative tribunal. Or when the public body finds that an action is probable or imminent. 
in which case the bias for the finding shall be reported and entered into the minutes of the closed meeting. And to consider collective note negotiate, negotiating matters between the public body and its employees or the representative for the deliberations considering salary schedules for one or more classes of the employees. Is this a roll call? Or just the it's it's it the uh, it's a voice vote. Okay, can I second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Um, um, all in favor? All right. Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? On September 13th, which is the approval of the settlement agreement for asking the identification that the Board of Education approve the settlement agreement and general release of asking with respect to the identification contract language as it relates to the pending Senate litigation. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Discussion. Uh, roll call, please. Audrey Adamson? Aye. Justin Anderson? Aye. Chet Smet? Aye. Kate Schaefer? Aye. Maria S. Trigueros? Aye. Andrew Weyer? Aye. Karen Walden Smith? Aye. All right. Number 14. The Board of Education approved the settlement and agreement and release of claims with claims to approve. May I please have a motion? So um, discussion. Okay. Roll call, please. Justin Anderson. Aye. Chet Desmet. Aye. Kate Schaefer. Aye. Maria S. Trigueros. Sustain. Andrew Weyer. Aye. Audrey Adamson. Aye. Aaron Walden Smith. Aye. Okay. Um, number 15 is. The Board of Education approves the settlement and agreement and release of claims with Jesus Risk with respect, approved, excuse me, with respect to any litigation in the Rockland County Circuit Court. May I please have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? All right, may I have a roll call, please? Chet Desmet? Aye. Kate Schaefer? Aye. Maria S. Trigueros? Abstain. Andrew Weyer? Aye. Audrey Adamson? Aye. Justin Anderson? Aye. Aaron Waldron Smith? Aye. Okay. We are to move to our end. Um, uh, I have a motion, please. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone want to stay here? No. All right, we are adjourned. Thanks for the talk.